risen up and you know 1.3 billion people just think of everybody has food on the table it's not a simple task but now if you travel to China you read about them and so on suddenly we have to you know accept the fact the Chinese has for the last 30 years has really really grown and you know improved tremendously so in a way perhaps the Chinese people now feel somewhat exceptional exceptional in comparison perhaps to other countries around neighboring country and so on and so forth so this is my point that the exceptionalism is a term really can only be expressed by people not just a government or official somebody declare we are exceptional uh, by styling by Mao or by Obama it's really have to be expressed by people and accepted by other people how people express it is because people really feel they are exceptional if you believe in freedom and you do have freedom you believe in you know uh, opportunity and prosperity and you believe in that you can have your own destiny and you do you know have the opportunity to accomplish that you will feel exceptional so this is my point when i wrote this article basically every country every nation can have exceptionalism and people can feel exceptional if if the country really is making people feel that way okay so let me see um, that is so that's my main point of my first column uh, a nation's exceptionalism can only be expressed by people not by political leaders making military threats or claiming statements so now when China is able to make more friends in the UN it makes her people feel exceptional I mean compared to say 100 years ago the Chinese people uh, people call them dogs now they feel they are exceptional they feel that their country make them feel exceptional and the Chinese government now has lots of uh, uh, reserves they are rich in a sense they are able to uh, giving aids to other country and colla collaborate and cooperate with other country to build infrastructures and so on and so forth and many third world countries like them that makes them feel exceptional same way as we were when Americans we gave a lot of money assisting many countries to uh, help development so on and so forth particularly after second world war uh, imagine I mean Japan has risen so fast to recover from the war because the American aid so now uh, in, in my, in my uh, sort of conclusion, okay, the American people dislike war, do not trust big government, okay, but yet we are seeing we have more wars, our government is growing bigger, and we are losing freedom with all of this spy things going on and uh, making people feel less exceptional 
So this is why I write this first article with this topic, followed uh, the Pudding's criticism and uh, Samuelson's response, quoting Moray about American exceptionalism. Okay, so that was the um, first column. Okay, I don't know how many we can uh, uh, sort of talk about today, but uh, we'll just do a couple of them. Okay, this whole roll of things are uh, articles I wrote. Okay, the second one is uh, uh, true um, conflict. Uh, third one is talking about Obama's stra strategy. The fourth one is about um, the m mainstream media. ABC TV has made a, a tremendous bad mistake, which uh, was also in the news. And then uh, uh, this next article is about the recent uh, uh, fly zone, or we called it uh, uh, some uh, air identification zone, or some uh, what it's called ADIZ. And that's all I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, this this uh, article basically is again, you know, reading the mainstream and things about uh, the flying zone and so forth, and all the reactions. Of, okay, that's that. And the next one, I wrote an article about Miss Caroline Kennedy uh, being nominated, or not being, being appointed as the ambassador to Japan, which I think uh, at this juncture particularly uh, is very important, you know, there's an important role for her to play. Uh, next article I wrote, uh, we, I talk about a new model for U.S.-China to uh, sort of work together. Uh, as people know that there's a term called G2, but how do you make the G2 to work together? Is you know, that article. And then next article um, I wrote uh, about um, Mr. John Kerry. Uh, and since he took over the Secretary of State from uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, um, I felt uh, there, again, some things that um, I read from the mainstream and organic and my own opinion what Mr. Kerry could, you know, accomplish in his turn. Next is an article about cyberspace, cyber war. As you know, uh, the S Snowden affair triggered tremendous amount of uh, uh, media uh, reports, articles about uh, cyberspace, cyber war, okay, which I wrote it on. Okay, now, let me see whether we have time to just see what the second one is. Okay, the mainstream organic number two by Dr. Wortman, okay. Um, it was published on October 3rd. True conflict in U.S.-China relationship. Okay, let's see. Um, let me, uh, okay. Now, I sort of repeated a little bit about this um, mainstream organic, okay, and my purpose of in this column. Let's just get into the topic. Okay, I wrote, the U.S.-China relationship and their conflict haven't been crystal clear due to the fact that the relationship can be look at that, looked at through multiple lenses. Political, okay, from a world arena. Economical, from trade, or deficit, debt financing, or 
military security threat, as we seem to be hypothesizing that, and cultural communication and exchanges, tourism, and many other different aspects, okay? Like cyber warfare, immigration, and so etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So if if you are diligent enough, okay, nowadays I tell you, one of the reasons I do this is I do sense and I do see people are so busy and not really able to pay attention to world affairs, foreign affairs, the big issues. I mean, sometimes we can't even pay attention to the candidates we're supposed to vote for. That is not good, okay? And we really need to pay attention to that. Okay, now, if you did read or pay some attention to the mainstream opinions on this issue, okay, on the U.S.-China a relationship, you would come away with the following view. China is evil and a threat, and the U.S. must target China as a potential enemy, not just economic competitor. Am I fair to say if you read many mainstream, you know, things about U.S.-China relationship, that is the image you get. Perhaps that's the image the mainstream wants you to have. Okay? Now, do we people as citizens simply blindly believe in mainstream opinion? My advice, at least myself, I wouldn't blindly believe that. You can you know, see many times, whether it's about our own internal domestic issue, politics, and so on and so forth, or world affairs, oh, such as you know, Snowden affair and so on and so forth. If you do blindly believe in mainstream media, I think, I think, can be dangerous. Now, the U.S. foreign policy so-called pivot to Asia-Pacific, okay? Again, it's portrayed by mainstream media as a necessary measure to curtail the China, so the rising, okay, as a power. Okay. Um, so, for the U.S. interests, and for the benefit of the world, we have to do that. The pivot to Asia Pacific, we have to deploy military power and uh, surround China. We need to link up with all the neighbors surrounding China, poss if possibly, to have military uh, sort of uh, agreement. Now, if you think about if you think the, the hypothesis was correct, as it said, China's evil, China's a threat, so on and so forth, that you do that, it seems to be logical. But if that assumption is not correct, and then how would you think China would take this? How would the United States think about this? In fact, in my article, I think uh, I did uh, uh, use example, uh, well, we may be jumping the gun a little bit, uh, about the Cuban crisis, Cuba crisis, right? When, uh, during the Kennedy time, um, when the Soviet wants to install a military base in Cuba with ability of shooting missiles, right? Literally, you might say, we went bananas. That's no, no. You can't do that. Right? However, 
Yet, now, United States is trying to use, in fact, the word use, Japan and many other countries to link up a sort of chain of a fence to curtail China. If you take a, the, the, the Cuba crisis versus this pivot to Asia Pacific, you probably can think about the consequences. Kennedy took great courage to blockade and eventually forced the Soviet to back down. It almost, almost, you know, it could lead to a major war, a nuclear war. Okay, that confrontation was very dicey. Now, should U.S. now sort of a lead a path into, I mean, lead this sort of build this confrontation, lead the path into that kind of potential war again? Is that to United States' benefit? or an advantage? I really don't think so. I really feel that that assumption made is arbitrary. There's no really evidence ever to show that China would attack United States sometime. Certainly not in the past. I mean, China was the ally with United States in fighting a, a aggressor Japan during the Second World War. China was always a victim for the past hundreds of years, victim of aggression by the Western powers, including Japan. But now we turn around, it's just because we have helped Japan to recover from the war, become a economic power, and we control them, more or less, we could use Japan and do this pivot to Asia Pacific to curtail China. I don't know whether that's a logic strategy or policy or not. Okay, that's why I write this. And I also, question, why is mainstreams all so uniformly sort of taking a position without really evidence the assumption was correct and the past is actually leading to something that is really beneficial to the United States or to the world, okay? This is the reason I wrote this article, okay? Now, I then, let's see. Okay, I now turn around, talk about mainstream and so forth. I say, in the US, under the freedom of speech law and the capitalistic system, Normally, all sorts of voices and opinions are permitted, but money and size of media enterprises influence and form the mainstream media. If you had to buy an ad in New York Times to express an opinion, which happened to be the case when the Prime Minister of Japan, Abe, uh, Ab, Ab, Abe Shinzo visited the um, uh, United States, fundamentally lobbying United States uh, to uh, uh, strengthen, widen the interpretation of the U.S.-Japan military defense, uh, mutual defense treaty to cover islands that Japan 
trying to claim. And those islands are historically part of Chinese, you know, territory. Those are facts historically. You can dig there's lots of documents and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get into that. But what I'm talking about here is at those days when A was the American Chinese, they had to buy an ad in the New York Times to balance a little bit of this mainstream media. At least only way to sort of get a voice out. And this is something that I feel motivated me to write this mainstream and organic column. Because you cannot keep away all this organic opinion. I used organic in the same sense as you choose to buy organic food. Because that's good. That's not poisoned. That's not necessarily biased or have some bad things in it. I use this word to discipline myself as well, that when you take the mainstream media, media's uh, materials and you talk about them, you should also take the organic medium and give the balanced view. Okay, so this again, um, because the first couple of columns, I like to you know emphasize the um, the organic aspect. Now, I say here, with the advancement of internet, there are websites, blogs, and social media tools available, as you all know. I mean, many people nowadays, you know, sort of sleep in the Facebook. So, uh, and these, these uh, social tools available for individuals. Therefore, there are lots of small groups, okay? They may have a special, you know, interest. I mean, interest doesn't have to be always in the politics or world affair, but some people do. And these people are intelligent people. They're interested. They are reading the mainstream uh, uh, information. They are digesting everything else, and they put their own opinions together. And those expressed, I really feel they can be called organic media because they are not controlled by the big money. They are not having a preconditioned you know, hypothesis or assumption, work for a certain industry or somehow associated with certain you know, power. And that part of organic media, in my opinion, we should get them out as much as possible. Now, in order to actually represent, you know, give a, a proper or a true representation of any controversial issue, I think our job is to dig out these organic media. Okay? Now, okay, I'm talking about this in the United States, we have all of this, but in China, okay? We have the impression, at least years ago, mass media equals government media. That's it. There's no other media. And today, with the internet, no matter how you see that, oh, China can have control, they can, you know, um, shut down websites and so on and so forth, we do too, okay? I mean, they, they deserve to be shut down, we should shut down. But there is enough grassroots blogs and websites flourishing in China. And I 
I browse them all the time. Sometimes I'm amazed. I say, wow. These kind of statements, uh, I, I think 30, 40, maybe 50 years ago, they definitely get put in jail, but all over the place. And there are groups even focused on denouncing Maoism, making a sort of judgment, new judgment of Chairman Mao. Those are all apparent in China. Now, this situation means even in China, there is organic media. And then they deserve to be circulated, to be talked about, to be analyzed, to be shared. Okay? So, um, in... in uh, this article, I talk about true U.S.-China conflict. The last paragraph, before I run out of time, is my, you know, at least my personal opinion, the true conflict really is not the political assumption, the evil thread you know, assumption. Rather, it's truly a lifestyle conflict. Americans used to a certain lifestyle. We believe in certain things. And, okay, let me just read this. Time is running out quickly. Americans are used to live in an easy credit world with all their material needs handily satisfied. People accumulate debts and government accumulate debts. The U.S. national debt has been growing and sustained by the government borrowing money guaranteed with her printing machine. Other people in the world also desire to have a better life. I mean, including the Chinese, okay? But they cannot just print the money. They have to earn it. They work hard. So the trade and so on, they accumulate money. So that conflict, in my opinion, is the true conflict. And we need to resolve that. And that resolution is not just we can send out the Navy ships, airplanes, and so forth, and make threats. I think that resolution, at least partly, lies in our domestic issues. Okay? All right, I think I ran out of time, and this article goes into that, suggests that uh, we need to look at our own problems instead of just making an assumption using military again to solve problems. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Uh, this is my uh, one hour show. Thank you for watching.